Hello? Hello? This this is just the WhatsApp group. No, no, the last two at the bottom. Oh, those are other people's addresses. What I was going to say is if you don't, if you're coming late and you're just generating a wallet, please copy the wallet address and post it to the WhatsApp group in the general section. And hopefully during one of the breaks, I'll be able to get you some Matic funds. Um, we did send out over $400 worth of Matic funds to all the wallets that we had registered, but I guess there are some people that are coming along to the, to the second session. Okay, um, are we ready to get started? We got, we got everybody here. Are we, are we live, Josh? We're live? Hello, Zoom. Okay. Let's settle away. Always. It's nothing, nothing that I don't, I always song and dance. Are you kidding? Okay. What can they see right now, Josh? They see what's on here? Okay. Let's see if we can get this. There we go. How's that? All right. Welcome back, everybody. Hope you guys had a good week and you told all of your friends about all the wonderful things that you learned at, in this seminar and how you're going to take over the world with new tokens and new businesses being created that are going to be fully decentralized and amazing. Um, I'm really excited about today's um, talk. We're going to create a DAO. We're going to mint tokens and you guys are going to get a chance to mint your own tokens. Um, and this is, this is a little bit of a scary talk. It's kind of like, I'm so glad we're an educational institution. You guys are going to learn some pretty powerful things today. And it's, it's a little bit crazy, but, but sorry, we'll, we'll, we'll get through it. We'll get through it. Okay. Um, so we're going to talk about DAOs. And I don't know if I did my, I didn't do my rant last time and I won't do it now, but I have kind of a passion for how poorly the world of crypto names things. So I like to use the phrase unique digital assets instead of NFTs. Because when I say unique digital asset, you kind of already know what I'm talking about. When you say NFTs, I have to first describe it and then I have to give you the definition and then you know we're 20 minutes down the road and you're already asleep. So DAOs, I don't particularly like the name DAOs because they're decentralized, yes. Are they autonomous? Somewhat, you'll see today. And they're an organization, yes, they are. I like to much, I much prefer to call them electronic boardrooms because it's kind of the place where you get together as an organization and you make decisions and you allocate resources. That's really what a DAO is. So is it a company? Is it an LLC? It could be all those things. This is for educational purposes only. Don't cry, come crying to me if you, you lose money. <laughs> okay. Um, I wanted to, to reset where we are in kind of this overall landscape. We talked about Bitcoin, we talked about other, other chains. We're going to focus primarily today in this area, like I mentioned last time. Um, and what's not shown here is, is, and I should probably add it, this DAPS, right within that DAPS is kind of the DAO, the world of DAOs. It's, it's a very much related to a DAP. It is a form of a DAP, um, but it's going to be decentralized. We're going to be able to create one. We're also going to be creating our own token today as well. Okay, so quick review on wallets. Um, and the thing that I like to focus on with wallets is what's different. Everybody knows a wallet, you know, you hold your money in your wallet. But it's, so, it's weird in the world of Web3 that anyone can see your balance. Anyone can put transactions in your wallet. Um, and, and anyone can um, see all the transactions that you do in, inside and out. And normally that would be fine if it's just a list of, you know, dollars, right? It's like, oh, I have this, this much money in my wallet and I move this much in and out. It doesn't seem that invasive. But when you start to think about what a wallet actually can represent and what it is, like an identifier, and you start to think about the other, you know, a whole years of financial transactions through a wallet that you own, right? It starts to look like a credit score, right? Or if you have an aggregation of wallets that you make representations to say, I own these wallets, then that whole history, that's immutable, right? We learned that last week. It's all immutable. It's going to be there forever. You know, that is now sort of like a credit score to all of those wallet holders. Um, or perhaps in the world of bad transactions, you know, some fraudulent transactions. Um, and then as we start to expand into what wallets can do, not just, you know, move money from here to there, but actually cast votes and make decisions about things and allocate resources. Now you're starting to talk about like a reputation that the wallet can hold on to. So I wanted to bring that up now because a lot of people are starting to think that way around what a wallet could really be. And I guess, you know, the phrase wallet starts to 
lose meaning, right? It's like a, it's like your credit score. It's your, you know, it's, it's your whole portfolio of, of investments. It's, it's all of those things. So, okay. Um, I wanted to do a quick side note. There's like probably 30 things in crypto that are just a little bit annoying. And this is one of them. If you see, oh, I guess this is, sorry about that. Can I move this off here? Okay. Um, the address that is your wallet is a big long 0x hexadecimal address. And that is called an EOA or an externally owned account. The reason why we all know that is because you guys created them. And there is a private key associated with control of that wallet. What you can do with that wallet is launch a contract, a smart contract, and that smart contract gets written into the blockchain, immutably written into the blockchain, and is available to be for programs to run against. But that contract also happens to have the exact same format of address. So when you see it in, in one of the block explorers, you're going to say, this address looks like a wallet, but it's actually a smart contract running. So I, I, when you get somebody's wallet address, if you type it into Etherscan or any of these other ones, it will tell you this is an EOA you know, wallet address or it is a contract. And I just wanted to bring that up right now because that can create a lot of confusion. Like, wait, what is this wallet address? And why does it, and a contract can have assets in it and can do all kinds of things. Um, a contract is actually spawned by a wallet address. So if you want to think about ownership of these things, you know, there is a private key associated with the end, the EOA account, the first one, and then any contract has been spawned by an EOA account. So in terms of the ownership of that, or like who launched that contract, there's going to be an EOA address associated with that. So as we kind of go through this and you think about all the smart contracts that are deployed on various blockchains, the ownership of those, you, you can look it up in the, in the block explorer and see kind of where the, where the, um, uh, where it was where it was actually created and who what wallet created that contract. Okay. Okay. Um, so let's talk about uh, fully web three native organizations. Um, they're fully online. And I mentioned earlier that you know they can be an LLC or a nonprofit. They can pretty much just be a group of people. They don't actually have to be any legal entity. They can they 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 are usually global in nature. Um, and I, not to not to go from MBA 101, but you know the purpose of an organization or the purpose of a board of directors is typically to allocate resources, right? To think about strategic direction and how you're going to allocate resources, and that boils down to kind of like making decisions and calling for a vote and making things happen. So, if you're trying to allocate resources, time, and money and assets, it's going to be within an organization, and that's what's captured in a DAO, and that's what really is focused on. A lot of people just focused on the financial aspect of it, but it's it's broader than that. So some examples are, you know, strategic decisions, investments, approving budgets. Um, but again, the weird Web3, when you're doing all this stuff, usually in a boardroom, you're at the law offices and you're in a very confidential conference room and you're talking about all kinds of things. Nobody knows that. And then the end result of the vote, people don't know how people voted, but they know the result of it, right? Like that's usually what's communicated out of the boardroom. In, you know, the world of DAOs, this Web3 world, everybody can see how every wallet voted. So if there's a decision that happens, you can see that. And we'll see today, like there's a bunch of very large um, DAOs out there and you can see the transactions that they're, that they're taking place, that are taking place and, and kind of the money that they're moving out and the tokens that they're purchasing and stuff. It's, it's quite nice from, a, from, you know, if you're just looking at it, but of course you guys as potentially running a DAO, you might think, do I really want to put this into a DAO or not? Um, so yeah, so all of the financial transactions are public and then all of the votes by all of the wallets that are owners of that DAO are public as well. Okay, so um, something called DAO tooling, I guess that's kind of the name for what the status of the, all the software that's, that's operating in the world of DAOs. Um, it's come a long way, but uh, it's, the, the, the UIs are not that great. Uh, and Aragon has been around for a long time and that's what we're gonna use today. There's also a new one called Colony. I was actually just talking to the head of growth of Colony, and he's very excited about uh, reputation-based voting. So you generate a reputation in your DAO, and you can vote based on how your reputation operates. And if you haven't been active in your DAO for a long time, your reputation falls off. So there's a lot of interesting things that are very crypto-native. There's not a lot of things that are sort of traditional management related because the world of DAOs and Web3s are trying to take organizations the way they know them and kind of come up with good ideas. So if there's one thing that uh, 
I wanted to mention to a group of Harvard Kennedy School, crypto needs to understand governance. <laughs> <laughs> sort of learning it by coding and learning it by figuring it out the hard way and stumbling all over ourselves and losing money and making bad decisions. But, you know, there, there's there very clear, clearly a need for, for um, you know, governance theory and governance history and stuff that we sort of all know. Um, it's, not, it's not very prevalent in the world of crypto today. So um, Aragon.org is probably the biggest one and, and most well-known. It is it is a little clunky, but we'll, we'll use it today. Colony, I mentioned, and then Dow House is a new one. And there's this is just a short list. There's like 30 other ones. There's Juicebox Dow. If you just Google like the best Dow tooling out there, I'm sure there's a bunch of other stuff that's, that's available too. Um, okay, so we're not going to use Ethereum mainnet, but when you go for real, most Dows are actually on the mainnet. Um, today, we're going to use uh, Polygon Chain. You guys all got the note I sent out. We were trying to use XDAI last week. You all have $1 XDAI in your, in your uh, wallets, um, but we need to use Polygon, which is roughly 10x more expensive than XDAI, so you have about 10 bucks in your, in your wallets of, in, on the Polygon Chain. So if you're trying to find it right now, um, seems to be you have to drop down and not select Ethereum mainnet, but select Polygon Network, and if you don't have it, you have to add it. And you should have one XDAI when you have the Gnosis chain selected, and you should have seven and a half Matic when you select the Polygon. Okay, good. Good. We're probably going to burn through a bunch of that today. So, okay. All right. So, and you guys can do this. So, we didn't really talk about this before, but if you want to set up as a group to create a company together, that's fine. If you want to do it by yourself, that's fine. Um, but just think of a company name and and a three letter token symbol that you want to use and it can be you can be a one of one that's fine um, or you can do it together in a group each one of you has enough matic to create an or to create an entity in your in your account and you're going to need the wallet address that you have and then if you want to do it together with a group you can get everybody else's wallet address so what i'd like you to do is go to client.aragon.org and select the um, Polygon chain to make sure you're on that chain within um, Aragon.org. I think I've got a picture here. Oh, wait a minute. Ah, before, and before we dive too deeply into that, there's one aspect of setting up a new DAO that's just a little bit complicated that I wanted to walk you guys through right now. There's a voting module that you'll get to in the setup parameters. And that voting module is anytime there's a transaction in or out of the DAO, you need to decide. And typically we do this as a group. You know, if you're going to set up an organization, right, you talk about how long should we have the vote to operate for. I believe it defaults to one day, but I recommend 15 minutes for this class so you can put up put in a vote and try it out. And then there's a minimum approval. And this is going to be the minimum amount of tokens. This is a token-based voting system. So in a minute, we're going to all issue each other or issue yourself a thousand tokens of your own minting, and you can have multiple different owners. So you can each have a thousand tokens of, of whatever kind of token it is. Uh, and then if the minimum approval is 15%, then that means one person, right, which would be 33% of the tokens would be, you know, would be above that minimum approval level. And then the next phase is, you know, 50% of the people that voted for it. So if you have three people, 3,000 uh, total tokens, and 1,000 tokens vote yes on something, that's above the 50% threshold. And then 100% of the tokens voted yes on something, so it's above 50% default. I realize this is kind of confusing, and Aragon doesn't really make it very clear for us, but I just wanted to mention this kind of slowly to think about it. What I recommend is that you put it as 15 minute time period for the voting period to sort of cast a vote and then um, use, leave it as 15% and 50% and then we can just go through some votes and try it out. It's just, this is only one part that's complicated in the whole setup of it. So if you go to client.aragon.org, are there any questions? Pause, yes. So let me take those one at a time and I'm going to repeat them for the Zoom audience. The first question was, where are smart contracts written and deployed? Uh, and the answer is there's a number of software development platforms that allow you to deploy smart contracts. And if you go to ethereum.org, 
they actually have an in-browser development platform that allows you to borrow the code from a smart contract that's there and deploy it right into the chain. And of course, you that gets into the, we're getting into the weeds though, but you have to have a private key and you have to have a, a wallet that has enough gas fees in it in order to deploy the contract from your command line, basically. We're gonna actually deploy a smart contract right now um, with no code. So there's, there's kind of like three levels to do it. One, you can hire a developer. The other one is you can do it yourself. And the third, do it yourself with code. Or the fourth, or the third is to do it yourself without code, which is what we're gonna do right now. So there is a smart contract behind all this stuff that will deploy, and which is one of the reasons why it costs so much Matic in order to kind of get it out there, gas fees. And your second question was? Oh, is it possible to have anonymous voting? Right now, the way the tooling, the state of the art of tooling is you will know the votes of the um, individual wallets. And if the, and it, it's not necessary that you know the identity of who owns the wallets. So there could be some changing around of people who own wallets or, you know, and, and one, one of the things you can do is kick somebody out of the board of directors and bring somebody else new in, right? So you could, there could be a vote by somebody who's no longer on the, you know, in the list of owners on that thing. Um, the idea of confidential voting is actually being actively worked on right now. There's an organization that I, I know well called um, Macy, I think it's called, and they're working hard on trying to figure out how to make anonymous voting. But the, and the hardest part is how do you make it unbribable? So if somebody walks into a, a you know, place to cast their vote and comes out again, or you know, they, they've been bribed to vote a certain way, there should be a way for them to prove that they voted, but there's no way to prove that Anyways, we can talk more about offline, but in the current state of DAOs, everybody knows your, the votes that you're in, so. Yes, sir. These are great questions. I'm impressed. You guys have been studying last week. It's great. Um, it's, always, it's almost always one token, one vote. So when we go and allocate tokens to your wallets, you know, you're going to mint tokens, and if you each have the same number of tokens, you're fine. If you want to have the classic argument that every startup has, which is, I'm the founder, I should get 90,000 tokens, and you guys can each have 1,000. It's almost, oh, the, the, the Aragon system is one token, one vote. So if you have 90% of the tokens, then it's like, you're the only one that can make a decision, actually, frankly, right? It's, it doesn't matter. I mean, you could set the parameters that we just described in order to kind of handle that, but that's typically how it, how it operates. Yes, sir. Yeah, so the question was, in the case of an investment DAO, as long as the tokens are available to be purchased, could somebody do a hostile takeover effectively? Yes, yes. If, if the investment DAO is not smart enough and, re, and wants to ish, list all of their tokens available for sale, and they sort of give out control, and then they don't, you can actually change the voting parameters, right? You could do a vote to say, hey, let's change the voting parameters, right? And then, and then change things as you move along. So, I mean, that would be a decision that you would have at a DAO slash board meeting, right? To say, hey, we want to issue more, we got to sell more tokens to generate more cash. And then let's have a vote to change the voting parameters because we're going to, we'd be up for, you know, getting taken over, right? So, yes, that is a risk. But then, of course, you have to ask the question, if you do buy it out, is it going to tank the actual value? So did you waste a bunch of money? Right? So, anyway, so that's, a, that's, a, that's a classic question, not a necessarily Web3 question. Any other questions? Is everybody at client.aragon.org on their browsers, and they all have MetaMask up with Polygon on there? And you'll notice this little spot right here. Oops. This little spot right here next to the Connect wallet that says Polygon. You just want to make sure that's selected and it'll give you some options to click on. And then you should click on connect account and connect your wallet to this, to the um, Aragon system. And then we're gonna create an organization. This is the fun part, this is the easy part. I realize that it's kind of, it feels kind of, you know, basic stepping through, but frankly, you know, in the world of COVID, it's kind of fun to do these things together collectively, right? So, okay, next step. After you do that, there's gonna be a number of templates. I wanna use the company templates. I'll leave it to you to research all of those other wonderful templates. I'm skipping a couple of slides, but if you just select the company templates, there's gonna be a voting module, a token module, and a finance module, that's it. Um, there's a bunch of other things you can do. Uh, so then you click on use this template. Then you have to come up with a name 
I can tell you that if you type in Harvard there, it won't be available because this guy got it. Um, and then it, it'll give you an automatic domain name as well. So if you type in a name there, whatever company name you want to have, then you can move on. And then this is the this is the complicated voting. This is the only complicated piece of all this stuff. So if you leave it at 50%, minimum approval rating, and then change this to 15 minutes, you can then configure it. And then on the next, uh, oh yeah, we got to give, you have to give it a company name and then a three letter symbol for your token. And then this is where you can add more. So if you have, right now I'm showing like one person as an owner of this DAO, but if you click on add more, and then this is where you're going to actually mint the tokens and allocate them to each one of the wallets. So this is like the most critical step when you're having a founders meeting and you're allocating, you know, shares to all of your founders or whatever the tokens might represent. Um, you want to make sure you capture everybody's wallet address in there. Yes, ma'am. You don't have the Ma you don't have Matic. Did you send your your wallet address in? Are you selected on Polygon Network? Nobody's got enough. Nobody's got enough funding, huh? Dang it. Um, well, just let's just make sure that if you were here last week and you and you um, submitted your wallet address, I sent out a bunch of Matic to a whole bunch of wallet addresses. Um, let's see. Um, maybe uh, did you fix it? Okay. You have to make sure that when in the MetaMask, um, here, let me let me just change over here. Dun, dun, dun. So in the MetaMask app, when you pull down MetaMask, this part right up here at the top, it says Polygon Network on mine. You just want to make sure it doesn't say Ethereum Network. It defaults to Ethereum Network. So I have, you know, I have some Ethereum in my Ethereum mainnet, but you want to make sure it says Polygon Network here. And if you don't have it available, you need to add that custom network. I've only got 20 more Matic in my wallet here, as you can all see. So, you know, if you need seven and a half Matic, I'm going to be hosed. So. All right. Do we, we, are we slowly working through it here? <laughs> uh, for, for the name that dot Aragon PM dot T E T H. Yes. I would use that just for today. This is, this is really just a test organization. So if you guys are, he, whoever has the Matic, if you can create your company name and give it the symbols uh, and then add the wallet addresses. So ho whoever you want to put in, if you just want to put your own wallet address there, that's fine. And then I recommend like a thousand tokens of whatever, whatever you want to mint. There. Yeah. Oh. All right. Let me just do it live here. Do it live. That's my. There we go. Okay. So, oops. Oops. No, I don't want to do that again. Up. I guess I shouldn't go back. Okay, so so this is where I so I've got um, connected to Polygon here on the on the right, and in MetaMask I've got it connected to Polygon as well. Sometimes some DApps get confused if your MetaMask is the wrong wallet. Some DApps are decent and, and recognize that and will actually give you a prompt to say, hey, you're on the wrong network, change to this network and, and it's automatic. Um, but if that's, is that the case for you, Tim? Your MetaMask wallet is on the Polygon network and your, okay. Well, I'm just going to look at this and you guys, if you guys don't have Met Matic, you can just look at the open an existing organization. So I actually created this harvard.aragonid.eth. And if I look at the tokens um, module here, is this all coming up on Zoom? Yeah. Okay. 
you can see what's that So on this one, I just use the default, the the support. Oh, the fifteen percent support level. So the question was on the voting, the fifteen percent. Um, that is the number of people who vote. So you have a certain threshold before it becomes a legitimate vote, and we set it at fifty percent. So fifty percent of the token or token holders have to vote, or sorry, fifteen percent of the token holders have to vote in order for it to be a legitimate election, right? As soon as you reach that level, the people who actually vote by the deadline, you have to reach the fifty percent threshold in order for it to pass. Yeah, keep it at 15 and 50. For now, I mean, you can mess around with that. You guys are the expert in figuring out all the voting stuff. So. Yeah. If you want, or you can just follow along. You have the Matic in your wallet. I don't know what you can do with 10 bucks worth of Matic after this, you know? Although I would just keep it in your wallet because it's really hard to get it into your wallets, right? That's the reason why I wanted to boot it up for you guys, because it's hard enough to just get some funding in there to have enough gas fees to do it. And it's going to cost about $5. It's going to cost about $2 or, you know, something like 1.7, I think, Matic in order to create a DAO. And then it's going to cost another like two Matic or so to actually list the token for, for sale. Yes, Josh, is there a question online? Yes, we just had... Um... Uh, one person with a uh, technical issue um, the co where the company templates won't load and they keep seeing an unexpected issue occurred pop up. Okay. So there, if there's a technical issue with Aragon, um, make, double check that your all of your MetaMask settings are correct, like we're talking about with the, with the network. And then what I've found with Aragon is that if you just do a full um, refresh of the browser, Sometimes it gets caught up in, and gets messed up in things and it, it sits the, in this like loading apps loop forever. Um, and I think doing a full browser refresh will sometimes bring that back. So have them try that. Other than that, it's gonna be hard to do tech support <laughs> remotely. Okay. So has anybody created an organization? All right, do we have some tokens? Oh, it does? Okay, try hitting a heart. Did you actually, did the MetaMask pop up? Because it's going to pop up and it's going to say, you have to spend like two Matic. Okay, so you did that. It might actually still be working. You can go to MetaMask and look at, look at activities. Okay, so it's still trying to figure it out. This is a non-trivial bit of, you know, blockchain work. Like it's actually minting new contracts and posting them into the Polygon blockchain and permanently locking them in. So it, it shouldn't necessarily be instantaneous. Yes, ma'am. Can you speak up? I, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> Wait, hold on. Um, could you repeat the settings to configure the template that you put? Oh, yeah, sure. You mean the voting? Okay. Where'd that go? Dun, 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 dun. Other questions? So right now, you guys are creating a company and you're coming up with the number of tokens from thin air. So I just suggested a thousand, why not? You know, you, could you make it a million? Sure. Could you make it 10 million? Sure. You're actually creating the total supply of tokens. And you know, obviously, if you get as you get more sophisticated, you want to really think about this before you lay it down and lock it into a blockchain. But for purposes of educational purposes, we just want to throw something out. Was there another question over here? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> got it. I got it. I got it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> we got to figure it figured out. Um, what I want to do is get to where we've completed the, the creation of the company, then we'll do a quick break, and then we're going to list the token for sale. But there's a key aspect of, of this organization that I want, to, I want to get solved. Yes, sir. And you tried the hard refresh? Okay. Okay. Maybe we'll need to take a pause and I'll come around for tech support purposes here. Um, let me just finish up on... on um, kind of, well, here, here's the actual MetaMask. This was done on XDAI. You guys have already done all this already. 
So the only, the only thing that I want to point out here that we're going to need later is after you're successful, which it doesn't sound like anyone, has anyone been successful at, at creating an organization? You did? What's your token? BND. Okay, we've got one token, BND. I'm going to buy some of that in a minute, as soon as we list it for sale. Anybody else successful at creating an org? It's called DAO, D-A-O. Awesome. You got that. That's good. Okay. Um, so what I have on the screen right now is once you get your organization created, and I'll just leave this up during the break, there is a, a token under the token module, which is on the left here, there's actually the token listed on the bottom. And, and if you click on that token, you'll see it gives you the address of the token. And that address, if you just click on C on Explorer, that address is a launched token that you've minted onto the Polygon blockchain. And it's an ERC-20 token. We haven't talked about ERC-20 tokens much, but I can tell you that 90% of all the major tokens that you've heard of are ERC-20 tokens. They follow that standard. So USDC, which is one of the biggest stable coins here by Circle Financial, is an ERC-20 token. DAI is an ERC-20 token. Just about all of the, the companies are ERC-20 tokens. Um, only The only things that aren't ERC-20 tokens are things like Matic and ETH and that kind of stuff even though you can create ERC-20 tokens with those. So you guys are creating an ERC-20 token contract. And if you click on that C on Explorer, which I will do here, let's see. Okay, so now you can see I've created a thousand HKS tokens. Pretty cool, huh? <laughs> and then I can look at the transfers um, that, it you know, I created this a day ago, as you can see, I created a thousand tokens. And then, um, well, I did some other things too that we'll talk about in a second. But the important thing to see here is when you when you start to use one of these block explorers to probe into what's happening on the blockchain, I can look at the contract that's been deployed. So what happened to your question earlier about, do you have to write your own smart contract? It turns out Aragon packaged that up for me, found the best smart contract, and then launched it and put it on chain for me. And I've got the source code right here. I can look, I can read. If you want to read Solidity, you can read the Solidity of the source code that's actually operating here. This is directly on chain and you guys should have the same, see the exact same code on yours because you're going to use the exact same company template that I did. So you can, you can read the contract directly from the Block Explorer. You can write to it if you have ownership of it, right? You have to connect to the web. But anybody can read from this contract, right? Because it's public. And if you have control of the contract, like I was the one that minted it, my wallet, if I connect to the Web3, I can actually write to the contract, which means I can approve tokens, I can kill tokens, all kinds of good stuff. So this wallet, the, the contract address is going to be important for the next segment that we're going to go through. Yes, sir. Actually, anybody can create a token with HKS or Harvard or any name they want to. Yeah. yeah. Yes, this is a good question. The question is, can anybody else create a Harvard or an HKS token on the Polygon network? The answer is yes. Um, so what I'm showing you guys, this is the reason why I was so excited about this talk because it's amazingly powerful that anybody can issue a token. And then it's like, holy crap, anybody can issue a token. <laughs> like, how do we know, like, which ones? And uh, you, you may remember last week I showed you the tokenlist.org, um, and there's a number of attempts to kind of having curated token lists. So if you go to coingecko.com or coinmarketcap, they just sort of list the top 1,000 tokens. There's a huge amount of effort to kind of curate token lists and find the ones that are legitimate and not scams. Um, there's plenty of scam tokens out there and you can go and I believe actually if I go right here and just say, you know, give me the ERC 20 tokens, uh, the top ones or the top transfers. Uh, let's see by market cap. So I can just pull up the list of all the top ERC 20 tokens that are on poly polygon network and by market cap. So presumably these are legitimate tokens, right? If they have a gigantic market cap. But as you get more and more into the weeds, you'll see there's a whole bunch of tokens that have been minted just for fun. And there's also a huge opportunity for scammers ahead of any kind of launch. If they hear, you know, people announce like the launch is coming, the launch is coming. Scammers will come in a day before and be like, hey, we launched this token, buy it. And they just, you know, sell a, a completely bogus token, right? It's, it's very easy to do. So 
I love crypto. I love this capability, but of course, you know, that, that side of it is very, very challenging. So hopefully you guys can help solve some of that, right? Yes. So we're, we're going to do uh, we're going to start trading the token in the second half of the class. So we're minting the token right now. It's not an ICO. We're just minting an ERC-20 token. So we're, we're creating a token, and, and you guys are putting it into wallets, right? There's been no financial transaction yet. It's just been basically all code. We've been creating an ERC-20 token, putting it into wallets. You can go back to your DAO and create more and submit more to other wallets and things. You can mint them out of, out of, um, out of thin air. Yes, sir. Yes. Correct. So the question was, if people are doing this, you know, the same name of things, don't you have to validate the contract address? And that's exactly what happens in any of these token curation things. You'll say, I want to buy DAI or I want to buy USDC. What is the valid contract address for that token? And if you look here, I believe it, well, it doesn't show you that. So, you know, for Tether or for, let's see, let's do USDC. So USDC has bridged a whole bunch of tokens onto the Polygon chain. And this is an ERC-20 token that has, what, $4 billion of volume. So there should be a, yeah, here's the contract. That is the valid contract address for the ERC, for the, for the USDC token on the Polygon chain. And we know that because Polygon, hopefully Polygon scan, scan hasn't been scammed, right? So. Man, I can't believe I bought that. I bought, I bought some Matic for you guys at a buck thirty, and now it's at a buck twenty-four. Dang it! Okay, um, maybe we can. Yes, one more question, and then we'll pause. Yeah, so so it, it's not required that you issue the the source code of the smart contract. It's typically, you know, it's a sign of legitimacy. It's like here's the source code of my smart contract, but it's not a requirement of the blockchain. Sometimes you only have the um, the application binary interface, just the binary version of it. This stuff down here, contract creation code and constructor, you know, this kind of deployed byte code, like this gobbledygook, which you can decompile. But anyways. Um, you know, when you when you post the source code, that's like, hey, this is what you're running. This is what you're going to operate under. Have your guys audit it and make sure it's doing the right thing and it's not siphoning off funds somewhere else. So if 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 there's a con, and a lot of times when people are hunting down hackers, they'll find the the code or the smart contracts that's being deployed that that is exploiting things. There's no source code, you know, posted with that because they're you know they're not doing the right thing. So. And it's not, I mean, there, there are some legitimate contracts that don't have source code, but usually they all do, the, one, the ones that I interact with, so. Any other questions? Otherwise, we'll take a pause for, for getting, making sure people have Matic. Yes, we got one online, Josh. Yes, we have a couple of online questions here. Um, first question uh, is a bit more general. Um, so this person is wondering, basically, all this feels like uh, an unregulated stock market. Does that sound uh, right to you? I think that's a good question for Tim back there. <laughs> so we haven't really talked about, oh. So I'll be coming back in six weeks to, to sit in the audience uh, with Jay, when Jay is up, Jay Clayton is up here, the former SEC chair. And, and I'll just be ready to, to have a bit, Bitcoin rap battle with him. It's going to be terrible, but okay. Got other questions? Yeah, I just got another just now. Um, can I sell these tokens OTC? Ah, so um, person to person over the counter, if you want to call into an OC, OTC desk, that does happen. And it does actually happen legitimately and legally. But of course, you go through any the same process you would go through in the in the, in the world of stocks if you wanted to sell something OTC. Um, you can sell it person to person. What does Tim think? 
does happen OTC, meaning through brokers, and it happens on platforms that are either decentralized or centralized. But I mean, this whole area is essentially unregulated. That's that's simplifying it a bit. There are state laws that regulate it. Some jurisdictions have regulated it, and derivatives on on Bitcoin and so forth are regulated. But the basic buying and selling of of uh, crypto takes place on unregulated platforms, whether it's through a broker or not. Yeah, and, and just to add to kind of the comment about isn't selling tokens kind of like an unregulated stock exchange. We haven't really talked about what a token is used for. I'm very clearly using it for ownership in a company in this example when we're listing a DAO. So therefore it feels like equity and it feels like you're trading equity in a company. And that's clearly unregulated and that's, that's the challenge. However, tokens have a bunch of different uses, right? You can use them for payments, you can use them for earnouts, you can do all kinds of crazy things with them. You don't have to list them for, for trading, but that's what we're gonna do after this. So why don't we take a quick break and let me see if, if anybody, I'll try and get Matic to everybody around here. Um, and uh, yeah, let me turn off my microphone and we'll be back in what, like 10 of, does that work for everybody? And then we're gonna list it for sale. So talk about an unregulated transaction. We're gonna do it guys. Educational purposes only, educational purposes only. <laughs> so it, if it's taking too long for things to load, first check your MetaMask, pull down your MetaMask and see if there's an active, if there's something actively happening on chain and you can actually look in MetaMask to see the transaction happening. If that's stopped, then it's probably Aragon that's slowed up and you should do a hard refresh of the browser. After that, it's gonna be hard to figure.
Okay. Are we back from break? It's a little longer than I expected. Okay. Um, I want to get on to the next phase of things. I know we're getting stuck on this thing, and I, I, I appreciate all your excitement about wanting to get Maddox so that you can do this too, which is fantastic. So hopefully, and thank you, William, for having Maddox in your wallet and helping out. I appreciate that. Um, okay, so what we're going to need is that address of the contract. And I recommend you you look at the Explorer like we were just doing a minute before the break here um, to just take a look at it. Uh, we all know about voting, so we don't need to do that. Okay, now we're going <clears> to... <throat> change gears, and list the token for sale. Um, but before we do that, I want to just kind of go through sort of centralized, decentralized exchanges. And I like to look at things from the lens of technology innovation. So there's like 14 different dimensions of technology innovation. And if I summarize it down into two and just focus on blockchain, what's interesting about blockchain, there's incremental innovation and architectural. And your guy, Clay Christensen, talks about disruptive innovation. And architectural, you can think of as a form of disruptive innovation. However, incremental innovation is kind of like making stuff lower cost, right? It's like, and of course, if you try and sell something and you say it's exactly the same that you have and it's just lower cost, and then people are like, yes, I want to buy that. The theory says advantage goes to the incumbent. So anytime, and that's what we talked about last week, a lot of large companies are saying, hey, just give me this blockchain and I'll take it private, forget the decentralization piece of it. And I just want to lower my cost because I want ledgers all over the place. Wouldn't that be fantastic? So we've seen a lot of that. And then an architectural innovation, of course, say it with me, decentralization. So decentralization of system and authority and the, the innovation theory says that the advantage goes to um, this here, new venture, a new entrant, right? So that's why you're seeing a lot of new companies sort of Eating this mantra of decentralization because they know it gives them an advantage. So um, one, the typical example of architectural innovation is, did it, is anybody old enough to remember Netflix when they used to mail DVDs around? <laughs> so if you think about like Netflix mailing DVDs and all of a sudden this thing called the internet comes along where you can stream them, it's like, it's like luckily they were able to spot that architectural change and say, okay, we need to pivot completely and come, totally dump this you know, mailing of DVDs and reinvest into streaming. Um, tip, that doesn't typically happen. That's one of those case studies where it's like unusual. Usually it's a new entrants who come along. It's like Netflix for the internet and we're smarter than the guys that are mailing around DVDs. Um, so with that as a context in the background, if we want to do, if we want to trade tokens, or actually, first of all, you know, how, uh, uh, one example of a decentralized business model is how can I confirm asset transfers anywhere on the globe with zero trusted intermediary? I was talking about this last week and actually getting the assets transferred, not like a debit or credit. So a lot of times when you do a visa, or, you know, a debit card transaction, that's just a, a, a register. You know, when you're sitting at the cash register and you're swiping your card, all it does is make a, a note to like debit this account later. And then they clear all those transactions later on. So the actual funds don't come out of your account. It's sort of a promise of that. So how could I confirm asset transfers anywhere on the globe with zero trusted intermediaries? That's basically every blockchain does that, right? Every Bitcoin does it, Ethereum does it, you know, all of the ones that we're working on do all that. So how about a decentralized brokerage? Let's say we want to issue tokens, we want to sell them. We want to, don't want to do it in a centralized way because we know how Wall Street operates. We want to do it in a decentralized way. How would we do that? So this is a, uh, I find this to be a wonderfully fascinating story of, of uh, kind of using decentralization in a new and unique way. But first, let's look at the central market. So on Wall Street, you have a concentration of buyers and sellers. You have high liquidity. You've got good volume, good price discovery. You've got all the market makers there. You've got a central place where all of the orders clear. It's wonderful, right? So if we wanted to decentralize that, the buyers and the sellers are already kind of decentralized, right? You have a whole bunch of companies that are operating and, and moving, moving fund, you know, selling stocks on, a, on an exchange. And then you've got investors that are all decentralized. So the issue becomes, how do I provide liquidity for the stocks that are being traded? And how do I, who, who makes the market for me, right? Who sets the price and who makes the market? So the guys at Uniswap solved this problem in 2018. And they basically said, who provides liquidity? We want everybody and the world to be able to provide liquidity. So today, you guys that have minted your own tokens are also going to be the liquidity providers for your tokens. So you're going to issue a trading pair and you're going to be the liquidity provider and then you, you can enable people to trade your token. 
It may be that the HKS token is currently live right now on the Polygon chain. We'll see in a minute. Um, okay, so just in terms of the quick history, Uniswap is kind of the innovator in this space. They're the ones that first came out with it, launching in November 2018. In fact, I saw him at I saw Hayden, the guy that founded this, at ETH Boston in 2019, um, and it was kind of like, is this going to work? <laughs> Back then, it was like, we're not really sure this is a great idea. Someone's going to hack it. They um, made the whole all of the smart contracts open source. They made it a public good. It's Uniswap.org, so it's I guess a nonprofit. Um, all smart contracts are open source. They've been heavily audited and heavily beaten up, and not to you know the question is is it successful? Well, I have his tweet here from May of last year showing a trillion dollars of of um, funds that have been transferred through his decentralized protocol. Um, but the big question is how does it solve decentralized liquidity and market making? So for liquidity you set up a trading pair and anyone can do this. So a, a simple example is an ETH die trading pair. You take 50-50 value. So I take you know $1,000 worth of ETH and 1,000 die, and I post those into the Uniswap pool, it's called. And I'm basically enabling trading between those trading pairs to happen on the, on the Uniswap um, smart contracts. Um, I, this was an error from before. I, th since the price of ETH goes up and down, you have to actually, the day that you're making the post is the day that the 50-50 the, the, the has to be settled. Um, each trade, when people trade from ETH to DAI and back and forth, generates a 0.3% fee, which goes to the pool. So when you post the trading pair, you get issued a liquidity pool token in, result, in, in return, and that liquidity token increases in value depending on how much trade happens between those two um, tokens. So that's what gives you the incentive to do it. There's something else called illiquidity um, that I can talk to people about um, offline that's a little more complicated. Yes, sir. This slide? OK, but well, we're going to actually do this. So I'll, I'll try one more time. So let's, I'll do a different example. Let's say I wanted to do uh, HKS token that I just minted and Matic. So I take whatever the value of HKS I think is worth and 50% of value of, of Matic. Let's say I think 100 HKS are worth a one Matic. And I post those into a pool, what's called a pool on the Uniswap exchange. And that, when I lock those into a contract, I get issued a token in return that represents my ownership in that, in that trading pool. So of course, a bunch of other people come online too, and they all get issued a, a certain number of those liquidity pool tokens. And that collectively becomes a very large amount of liquidity so that I can enable a lot of trading. That's just the first part though. That's all that is, is liquidity providing. That's not setting the price. That's the next phase, okay? Okay, we're gonna actually do this too. So you'll get, a, get your hands dirty. Okay, so then the question is, how do I set the price? So Uniswap decided to use an automatic market maker, which is just a constant product formula. And, and this is the only equation in the whole talk. Does anybody know what shape this curve is? We have some math nerds in here. <laughs> it's, it's, and since we're at Harvard, I guess I'll say it's N hyperbola. <laughs> yeah, it's hyperbola. Um, where X and Y are the number of tokens that you've, you've locked into your trading exchange, and then K is just a constant. So that's set when you first define the, the liquidity pool. And then that changes over time depending on how much trading happens. So if we look at this, we look at this in a very simple way. And by the way, I have another slide in here that goes through an example. I'm not gonna go through it tonight, but it'll be in the slides when you guys wanna look at them if you wanna see kind of, if you wanna play through kind of an example. So the nice thing about this hyperbola curve is when you, if you think about it, if I'm trying to drive, somebody said here, if I, if I buy out 51% of the tokens, if I try and drive this and really drive the supply of tokens too far in one direction, it'll just start costing me infinite, infinite amount of money, right? I, there's no way I can deplete the pool um, just by, by buying and selling in either direction, right? I, I can't do it. So the, the nice thing about this hyperbola curve is that it kind of keeps prices sort of in the middle. Um, of course, that assumes that the size of your trade is small relative to the size of the pool. If you have a you know a big percentage of the pool trade, you're going to really mess up this curve. So it's it's totally it's interesting and it's fun and there's a ton of data. Obviously, a trillion dollars worth of transactions to look at behind this. So th this is what we're going to use. Um, and just just a quick thing on Uniswap. 
There's been three versions of Uniswap. Today, we're going to use version two because it's the simplest and most mature. There's a more complex one called version three. Um, you know, $4 billion of total value locked in liquidity pools on Uniswap now, seven billions of trades in 24 hours. And the largest pool are DAI USDC. So going from a, a you know, currency-backed stablecoin to a uh, algorithmic stablecoin. So it's supposed to be a dollar for a dollar. So why do people want to trade those back and forth? Well, sometimes there's different, different um, needs for, you know, different currencies. And luckily, it stays very constant, right? So you can collect a lot of fees in enabling those transactions. And then BTC ETH is another big pool. Yes, sir. They collect some of the fees. That 0.3% fee of all the transactions, some of it goes to the Uniswap DAO holders. So you can actually buy the Uniswap token and some of the fees come to the Uniswap. But you have to ask Tim if it's allowed or not. This is for educational purposes only. Some people in other countries buy the Uniswap token. How about that? Can we use that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the, the other thing about Uniswap, and you know, you look at 2018, you look at how many billions of dollars and the fact that they're open source. Okay, you're open source, you're successful, that means forks. Does everybody know what a fork is? Basically, just copy and paste your code and change the name on it. There have been a ton of them. PancakeSwap is on the Binance chain, Curve, Balancer, SushiSwap. And on Polygon, there's something called quickswap.exchange, which is what we're going to use in a minute. So if you want to go to quickswap.exchange in the same browser that has your MetaMask on it, you can check that out. And then if we had the Gnosis chain working, we would be using honeyswap.org, which is the Uniswap fork that's been ported to, to Gnosis chain. Okay. So you're going to provide liquidity for your XYZ company or HBS or HKS and Matic. And I want you to connect to that quick, what was it called? Quickswap.exchange. I always forget that name, quickswap.exchange. Does everybody have it open? Pull it up here. There we go. So here's quickswap.exchange. Oop, and you're, and you're seeing my wallet connected to it right now <laughs> with, a, with a pool here. So if you go up to the top where it says pool, so, and, and then I want you to select version two. Is everybody following along? This is fun. You see the pool up at the very top here? So there's swap and pool. Those are the two main ones, right? I want to pool LP tokens and I want to swap one token for another one. So if I go pool and then I say version two, then you can select one. This is the pool tokens that you're going to create. So I select a token here, Matic. And then if I select, so this is where it gets tricky and this is where it gets advanced. So that contract of the tokens you just created, when you click select token, it's not going to be up here, right? It's not a curated token. You just minted it two minutes ago. So what you have to do is paste the address of the token in this search box up here. And if you paste, and let me just see if I can pull up. Yeah, this is this is my oh no, that's not my token. It is okay. So this is my contract address for the Harv the HKS token that I created. So if I paste it here, you'll see that it it goes and searches and it found this HKS token. And it may actually give you a warning saying, hey, whoa, whoa, we don't know anything about this token. Are you sure you want to provide liquidity for it? And of course the answer is yes. So then this is where you set the price. Now there's been, you know, MBAs and theses written about price setting for various things. We're going to cut off all that stuff and just say, you know, I hope you guys all gave yourself like a th at least a thousand tokens in your, in your wallets so that from the wallet you have, you can actually put in maybe a hundred of your tokens. And then I would suggest you use probably, well, this price has already been set, but you, you use kind of like a, maybe a one Matic or less than one Matic to, to, to balance it out. And that'll be the 50-50 pool. So what you're doing at that point, since there's no pool for this token, you're setting the price for your token, which is, which is a little bit crazy. It's kind of, that's why, that's why I said this class was going to be a little bit nuts because it's like, boom, boom. Hey, we're just going to create an organization and set a price for it and start trading it. It's a little bit nuts. Questions? Yes, ma'am. Oh, 
the token address was from the uh, Aragon app, the Aragon front end. Let's see, right in the token module. Where was it? Uh, right here. So if you get the, the actual client.aragon.org and then you click on the token module, you should so, show the, probably just has one person up here. And then at the bottom, it says token. You have to click on that. That's the secret. It looks hidden. It looks just like it's a has the token name. If you click on that, it'll give you the address for it. I would put less than that. I would put like what, however much Matic you have, I would put like maybe 0.5 Matic because you, you want to try this multiple times and, and I don't want to keep sending you Matic. <laughs> okay. Is anybody, is anybody supplying a liquidity pool? There's a couple of steps after this that you have to do as well. You have to approve the token for supply and then you have to supply it. This one over here? Oh, okay. So, so I clicked on it here and then I pasted that address from the Aragon. Remember I was saying like in the token in Aragon, we're gonna need that contract address. So that's the, that's the actual token that you created in Aragon and we're using it in QuickSwap in order to provide liquidity for it. This is good, this is good. You guys are uncovering all the secrets of blockchain in the world of Web3. It's fantastic. So, so see, see what I did here? I, I copied and pasted the, wall, the contract address for the HKS token up here, and it pops and it finds it. You have to wait because it's definitely not fast. I mean, I've found it a bunch of times already yesterday, so it's in my cache. Anybody else want to answer that for him? Client.aragon.org is, is in the token modules where you find it. Down here? Oh. Okay. Clear this other way. This blue button. So what's what's going to happen is it's fairly slow. So once you have it in there and you can approve it, there's going to be there's going to actually be an approve button here before there's supply. And you have to, you basically, the Uniswap protocol says you have to approve tokens for use in a pool before you can actually supply it. So there's a couple of steps you have to go through. Not long, I mean, like 30 seconds. If it's taking longer than 30 seconds, somebody might be wrong. You might want to do a, fret, a refresh. I would put... Well, I've got like 100 tokens here and then like 0.3, so 100 and 0.5 or something. You know, there, there's a limited amount of Matic that you have in your wallet and it's, it's real money. So, so, so you were creating a tiny little liquidity pool here. And then we're going to have to do a trade that's even smaller than that liquidity pool if we don't want to impact the price, right? So we had, that, we had that like big curve that shows that you're going to massively impact the price if you do a big percentage of the liquidity pool. So whatever you select here, just remember that relative amount. So if you put a hundred of your tokens in there, then when we go to trade them, I suggest you trade like one token because <laughs> then it'll be like 1% of the total liquidity pool and it shouldn't have a big impact on the price. That makes sense. Invalid pair. Okay, let me, let me uh, go through a couple more steps here and then we'll do another break for tech support. I can't believe how much text is. Clearly, this is not as mature an industry as it needs to be, right? I'm not going to supply anymore. Yes, sir. Hold on. Okay. Yep. So, so I'm actually entering a new amount to supply, just as an example. So I put in 100 tokens here, and then it, it automatically came, it automatically filled in the Matic based on the current, because I currently have a supply in there right now. That's shown right here. 
So I'm, curr I'm currently doing a liquidity pool for this pair of Matic HKS. Yeah, approve, and then it'll, it'll bring up MetaMask and do an approval process. And then it should say supply, which allows you to supply the token. And when we're done with that, we can do, we can do an actual swap and exchange and buy the token. Let's see, where are we here? Dun, 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 dun. Okay, let's do a let's do a, a five minute break, and we'll do. Are there any questions online, Josh? Almost there. Almost there. We're good. Okay, we'll do a five minute break for tech support purposes.
Okay, uh, let me do a let me do a quick um, sort of reality check on how MetaMask works. You, uh, some of you guys have been running into this. When you pull down MetaMask from your browser, there's a assets and activities. And if you go into the activities area, you'll see the transactions that are waiting. Um, some one group had like four or five transactions that were waiting and it prevented them from doing any other track of transactions. You'll see that at the bottom and you can say like reject transactions. Uh, any of these transactions, if you click on them, you can view in the block explorer. So that'll bring you to a, a picture that'll show you kind of what's happening. And you can see here that this has been successful. So whatever that transaction was, it's done and it's complete and it's been written to the chain. The other thing you can do is if your tokens aren't showing up in your wallet, you can say under assets, you can say, uh, let's see, import token. So this is the same contract address of the ERC20 token that you just created. So if you paste it in there, you can set up, actually you have to do a custom token. So if I, if I paste in, let's see if I can find that. There we go. This is my HKS token. If I wanna show it in MetaMask, I can go here and say assets, uh, import tokens, custom token. And then if I just paste the contract address, it should, it does find HKS and then 18 decimals. Did we talk about the decimals? Did I mention that already? Okay, real quick. Um, cryptography operates on integer math, integer only math. So one of the challenges of integer only math is that I don't want to just trade one Bitcoin all the time. That's like $23,000. I want to do, I want to have a decimal of a Bitcoin, right? So in the world of cryptography, how do you match integer math with decimal points? And what you do is you carry it in two numbers, right? You say, here's an integer that's the supply of tokens. And then the number of decimals is 18. So there's sometimes if you read about people that have problems with they accidentally sent a 10 trillion tokens. It's because they put one in and it was actually one times 10 to the 18th. They didn't realize there was actually 18 zeros after it, right? So that's an option that you set when you create any ERC20 token is how many decimals you typically carry. And the default is 18 because that they felt like that was enough precision in the number of tokens. You know, like I can have one times 10 to the minus 18th tokens is the smallest unit. And that's pretty damn small. Um, so that, that's why it says decimals all the time, because it's not always 18, but almost it's almost always 18. So the, the, the standard that you guys use is, is an 18 decimal. So you can see now I, now I have uh, HKS tokens in my wallet here. Woohoo! And there's no value associated with them. Why? Because I created them yesterday. Okay, so who has some tokens that I can buy? Actually, okay, we, we forgot that last part. So, so the, the last part is to swap tokens. So if you go to the swap tab instead of the pool tab under quick swap, you can go from Matic and then you can select, select the token that you have in your wallet if you wanna buy some of your own tokens, which would be kind of silly. Let me just do 0 0.01. And if you try and do something crazy, like let me buy you know, 100 Matic worth of HKS tokens. I happen to know there's not enough supply for that number. Um, one, it, it doesn't even give me a value, but if I, if I try and buy 10 Matic worth of tokens or maybe one, it's not even giving me a result. Um, Oftentimes it will say like insufficient funds or insufficient um, you know, money in the pool, or the price is going to change way too much in order, you know, the price impact is going to be too large. So if you're on that part of the curve where all of a sudden you're going to push it way out, it's going to say, whoa, you know, you can get one more token for all this more money. Are you sure you want to do that? Um, and that that I guess it's just kind of broken right now. Maybe I don't have enough, don't have enough Matic in my wallet here. Let's say 0.1 be able to buy 0.1 worth, maybe 0.01 worth. Price impact is more than, oops, did you see that little, little had a little teeny warning that price impact was too high. Let me just see if I can pull that up again. I try and buy 0.1 Matic worth. Oh no, that's let me do it. Okay, let's try one. Here you go. Price impact is more than 15%. Please use V2 or V3. <laughs> in other words, it's okay to be crazy and make the price impact too high. Just use a different version of the software. So if, if you just lower the amount that you want to buy, that won't have that much of an impact on the overall curve and it should let you, you know, easily just purchase it. But this actually still has a 7.9% impact on the price if I want to swap it. And then I can just swap it. So then I'm swapping 0.1 Matic for 27.37 HKS. 
I can confirm that transaction. And it's what, what does it say? It was costing me like 0.2 Matic in order to do a 0.1 Matic trade. Then you can look at it on the Block Explorer and we can we actually watch it happen live, watch it get written to the blockchain live. So right now it's operating, it's trying to do its thing. So just for purposes of example, if the price impact, so the question was, what do you do if the price impact is too high? You can either lower the amount that you buy because then it won't, you know, that curve, if you're trying to buy way too much on that curve, it'll, it'll give you that warning. You can go into advanced mode and override it sometimes if you don't care. Um, but typically just for purposes of example, I just lower the amount that I want to buy and then it won't have as much of a price impact. Right. So, so, what we just saw, what you guys just saw on the screen here was, I just did a swap transaction and then I went immediately to the Block Explorer to look at that transaction hash. And what happened live in front of us was it actually was confirmed and it shows me success here. So that, so I purchased this token and what you can see is I interacted with a Paraswap Augustus Swapper contract and I transferred uh, WMATIC out and I got back in HKS shares here. So my wallet should have, you know, 27 more, what did I have before, 500 or something? So I should have 27 more uh, HKS tokens in it. Yeah, 527 HKS tokens. So. Shoot. Yep. Somebody hacks MetaMask. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. How do I get money on and off the blockchain? We're going to have to excuse Tim from the room in order for me to answer that question. No, so the, the answer in the United States is Coinbase. Coinbase is regulated. Um, they, 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 are, they have on-ramps and off-ramps to Polygon Network, to Ethereum mainnet. I'm not sure if they have Gnosis Chain or not, but you can bring it to Polygon, you can bring it to Polygon and then bridge it over to Gnosis Chain if you need to. Yes. Yes. Okay, so there's a couple of things that can get confusing in here. Coinbase has its own wallet, and that's not what we're talking about. We're, MetaMask is the wallet we're using today. Coinbase Online, which is a centralized exchange, you can host, you can put your Matic into Coinbase Online, in which case it's their wallet, and you just have an account that you're operating with. That's the centralized exchange world that I we can talk about, but it's not really the fun part because it's kind of well-known and like some big company holds my tokens for me. And if I lose my keys, they'll find it for me and everything will be fine. I'm trying to give you the world of the wild west of the decentralized exchange where you have MetaMask, where you guys have the private keys for your wallet and nobody else does. So it's a huge amount of power and independence, but it's also scary because if you lose it, there ain't no recovery, right? There's no, get, no getting it back. So Coinbase is very useful for on-ramping and off-ramping. So if you have a MetaMask wallet and you have a Coinbase centralized exchange account, you can move that Matic from your, you can just send it like I was sending you guys, send it to your, the interface for the, your Coinbase account on the chain. And if you go to Coinbase, that's, it says like, do you want to deposit Matic tokens? Here's a QR code for it, or here's the address that you send it to. You send the Matic tokens to that address and it gets deposited into your account. And then you can exit it out to the banks. Yes. Well, you can certainly convert it back to fiat. So, I mean, I really did give you guys free $10 or Tim gave you guys free $10. Um, you know, so, so it could be, and, and it's going to be burned up in all the gas fees that we're using, right? Like we basically all burned like $5 worth of gas fees today, tonight, right? So, um, so yeah, any other questions? Let me just see if I've got any other slides here. Yes, yeah, shoot.
Yes, you should have more. I mean, if you, if you took some from your wallet and created a liquidity pool, then, then those are on the Uniswap contract and they should be out of your wallet, right? Because they're locked into that contract. And then when you bought some, there should be less Matic and more tokens in your wallet. So that, I just showed you that, right? Because I had 500 HKS tokens and I bought 27 more. So, you know, my Matic balance went down and my HKS tokens went up. That's what should happen. So, yes, Josh. Yeah, we got a few from the folks here on Zoom. Uh, first question. Um, when you load a wallet with money, either from something like a credit card or another source of uh, another yeah. source like a yeah. cash bank account, et cetera, the person who's loading the money, their identity is clear. And but with the transaction being linked to a wallet, how do you reconcile with claims that wallets are anonymous? Mm, mm, mm. Good question. Okay, so the example that we used tonight in class, uh, or, or last week and today, you guys all created a wallet just sitting here, right? And you just, all you did was click on the stuff and create the 12 words and you got a wallet address. That's completely anonymous and no money is in that wallet. In order to get any money into that wallet, you have to do a transaction from some other source. So luckily for all of you guys, you're all connected to me now. So, you know, whatever, including Professor Tim back there, I believe he has a wallet that I sent money to. So we're all now connected to each other. So I suppose, you know, don't do anything mean bad with your wallets because it might come back to hurt me, right? Since we're connected together. So the question it was, you know, if, if I have an actual fiat currency wallet that's moving money into a, into a crypto wallet, yes, that is absolutely traceable. Um, but it's usually through like a Coinbase exchange that that money is moved. And, and what's happened, and, you know, I love to read all about the activities that happen on crypto world and how they're able to trace these guys down. They subpoena the central exchanges and they say, give us the names of the people that, and what accounts they have and what wallets are interfacing with the rest of the world. And then they can, they can do all that tracking. So, so, so yes, ultimately it does become not anonymous. Yeah. And then um, next question, can you please explain what is an off chain Bitcoin? Is it like a fork? I don't know. If the question is what, what's an off-chain transaction, that's a transaction through, for example, Coinbase in the sense that you're sure. not actually selling or buying on chain, you're buying through a ledger account. I don't know if that's what they're getting at. Yeah, I mean, when you think about the wallets that you have, all of the currencies are on chain and all you have is like a private key that gives you access to those currencies. It's, you can't like take the currency off the chain and do something. That's what, that's what I was thinking of, but I get it, I get it, yeah. But the wallet is really the key, right? It's, it's really a store of the private key. It's not really the crypto, right? But, right. Other questions? Yes, sir. So the question is, how do we set the price of the tokens that we just minted? The answer is before there's any pool that's created. So if there's any pool created, then there's already a price set. But before any pool is created, you have the opportunity to define what that price is going to be relative to the trading pair that you have. So you, you could have said, I want to trade my token versus USDC. And you could have set up those two and said, this is the price that I want to set. I just selected Matic because we needed that for gas and it happened to be a convenient currency that you all had. So you could set a liquidity pool for that. So the first time the liquidity pool is created is when the price is set, but then it adjusts over time with the trading. No, the first trade, when you say, I want to put in this much Matic, it looks at the liquidity pool and says, how much, how many tokens are you going to get from that trade? And that's when it does all that calculation where it says, whoa, you want to you know, buy 100 Matic worth of this token, there's not enough available. Or you want to buy one Matic, you're going to impact the price too much. So it does that calculation along the curve and it says, okay, you're fine. You know, I can give you 27 tokens. Or, oh, I can't give you 270 tokens because it's going to give you way too much. You know, it's going to impact the price too much. Or, or I will if you override it. Does that make sense? So you set the price when you create the pool and then trading. Trading will adjust the price a little bit along that curve. But it's not gonna. You're not setting a price at that point. You're just trading it because of supply and demand. 
Yes. Yeah, when you hit approve, after those two numbers were set, you set the price at that point. When you clicked approve, that's been locked into the pool. I mean, you didn't have to do the supply if you didn't want to, but be a little bit foolish. Yes, sir. Yeah. I think in, inside the client, you can do that. I think there's some settings and some advanced settings where you can give wallet addresses specific names so you can refer to them as names. I think, I think there's some editing features and stuff like that. Um, so I want to do a check. It, we're over time already, but I do have a whole other section. Last week, I said something about investment clubs. So I don't know how Tim feels or Josh feels. I can do a quick 10 minute on investment clubs. It's a really cool thing and it's really simple. Do you guys have enough time? I mean, if you need to leave, obviously you should leave, but, but uh, if we can go a little bit longer, I, you ready? Okay, let's do it. This is a lot easier. So um, there's something called Gnosis safes and they're a multi-sig. So this is an example of, you just wanna have five of your friends and you wanna co-own, you wanna pool your, your capital and you wanna own some NFTs or some assets or something and you wanna, you wanna organize it. Gnosis Safe has about $40 billion of assets under management within their smart contracts. They don't own that. They just launch the safe and do it. Um, yeah, so this is, uh, okay. And it's also a hell of a lot simpler than, or Aragon too. So you just decide five of my friends, three of five are going to be the, is what it takes to do the threshold. There's no time limit on the votes. They can sit out, sit there forever. Um, and there's no kind of, you know, what size, you know, can these people, if it's a $20 transaction, you need three of five. If it's a $10 million transaction, you need three of five. You know, if you decide on what that vote is. So when you create a new Gnosis safe, and this is like a digital online safe you can create, um, you decide what that voting threshold is. I mean, I could, I, I, I was going to start with this, but then I realized I didn't have any time. So this is like a lot simpler than the Aragon thing. And it's just for holding, holding assets. So if you, if you go through, and what I recommend you guys do, you don't have to do it now, you can do it later on, is go to the Gnosis Chain page, or you go to your, use your Gnosis Chain, your 1x die, and you can use the Gnosis safe and create a safe for yourself. Um, so, and you can also create a one of one, right? So you can create a safe that you own by yourself. Can anybody think why you would want to do that? Why would you want to have a safe that only one wallet owns and controls? Could be. Um, remember what I said before about you have an EOA address and you're launching a smart contract? This safe is a smart contract based asset store or digital safe. If you have a safe that's owned by one wallet and that wallet becomes compromised, if you're fast enough, you can actually change the owner of that safe over to a different wallet that you create and then you don't have to worry about that wallet being compromised anymore. So this is one of the things that 2023 is working on heavily is how to get how to not have to do these 12 words writing down and now how to not have to store private keys, how to do social recovery, how to do account abstraction. And one of the things, I know the guys that safe really well, they just raised hundred million dollars of capital last year. Um, they're uh, really pushing hard on account abstraction and like saying everybody should have a safe because if you have any issues with your keys or anything else, you can change out owners. Um, and it's, a, it's a, actually a wonderful and, and the user interface is a lot better. On it. It's not quite up to speed of Web 2 yet, but it's probably the leading edge of, of, of useful tools out there. So this is, let me just whip through this quick. You guys can do it on your own. If you want to create a new safe, I did this for the MIT Bitcoin Club. Um, you can add an owner, you can add a bunch of it, and then you can just decide down here, one out of two owners or three out of five owners, whatever it is, depending on how many people you add to the list. Um, and then it gives you this, it gives you this kind of new naming structure, which is the address of your wallet and then it says gno if it's on gnosis chain or it'll say eth if it's on mainnet and on xdi of course it's a lot cheaper to create uh, a, a safe what is that a thousandth of a penny so you should be able to create a whole bunch of saves if you want to um and then the question is remember what i said before about everything on the blockchain is publicly available well how big can safes get there's actually a bit dow safe that has $2.3 billion in it. And this QR code is a link to the safe 
if you want to if you want to click on that. Um, and you can see that this is a three of six. Can you guys see that? It says three of six. So that means there are six owners of this safe and three people have to make the transaction. And right now there's a send $40 million transaction where only one of three people have, has approved this. This is actually an old picture from a while back. Um, but you can imagine, you know, like these safes that, any, and, I'm, and I'm, I don't even know these, I mean, I know one guy at BitDAO, but I, I don't have any access. I'm not one of the owners. There's no way in hell I would tell you guys I'm an owner of a $2.3 billion safe sitting right here, right? That would be a little <laughs> bit foolish. But I just want to point out that like there's a lot of money that's that's sitting in some of these things that you can just watch and take a look at. So right now you can see they have 18 tokens, they have two NFTs in their, in their wallet. And if you go to this QR code now, you can see what it is today. I think it's a lot more. And you can see the transactions they take and kind of who voted for those transactions. So there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of precedent and there's a lot of money, you know, being put in these smart contracts. So there's there's the question of, do I want to review the code or do I just want to trust the fact that $40 billion is being held in safes and hasn't been hacked? So you know, take your pick, maybe do both. Okay, that's it. Just wanted to do that quick thing on, on, uh, on, on Gnosis Safe. So any other questions? <coughs> If you're getting too much price fluctuation, one way to do it is to add liquidity to the pool. So it just becomes whatever the, the, the trading amount becomes a smaller and smaller percentage of the pool and that will have a smaller and smaller impact on the price. I mean, if you see how that, that curve works, right? If, it's, if, if, if the trade is like a small movement on that curve, then it's gonna have a very small impact on price. But if it's, you know, if it's, if it's a big impact, you know, if it's a big amount of, of tokens relative to the size of that curve, the, more, you know, the bigger the liquidity pool, the more that curve moves out. So, so if, you know, and you can, this is like the number of X tokens, number of Y tokens. So if I, you know, I'm trying to buy like this much tokens, it's not going to move much. Uh huh. Uh huh. Because you took those tokens and you put them in the liquidity pool, right? Oh. Yeah. So now Uniswap contract is one of the voters in your DAO. You sent me some tokens? <laughs> Woohoo! Yeah. Any other questions? Otherwise, we can close down. I'll stay here for a few more minutes if you guys want to chat. I'm happy to connect on other things. Hell yeah! <laughs> yeah. Let's see. Does, does somebody, did, did you guys post your token? Uh, okay, all right, all right, all right. I've been, I've been, here we go. Okay, who's got, who's got a token here? Stay lit fam? Who's that? It's a good one? Wait, where's the address? I need to, I need to have the address though, because they're fresh tokens. Oh, by the way, I, I need to show you guys. This is kind of funny. Uh, in QuickSwap, you know, I have this this Harvard HKS token. Someone just randomly bought a bunch of these tokens, like out of the blue. I don't know how they found them or what. I think they're just probing the the Polygon chain. But I I was able. Oh, actually, let me let me show you this real quick. Um, it's all HKS. So the other thing you can do once you have the, the thing here is I can look at analytics for the for the token pool and you can see, woohoo, I've got, you know, what is this, $1.76 worth of liquidity and I've I've done 55 cents worth of transactions. Isn't that amazing? And then you can look and see the actual trades. And I know all of the trades except for this one. I don't know who bought 45 cents worth of HKS tokens, but they just did. It's kind of random. So yes, it's live, and anybody can buy them because I I posted them for sale on the liquidity pool. So. Okay, which one am I buying here? Well, it's it's not going to be in my wallet because I have to have your contract address in my wallet. If you just minted your token, then.
Yeah. You send it to me. Yeah. So it's not going to show up in my MetaMask. Oh, do you send it? You send it to Polygon? Okay, wait, hold on a second. Hold on. There's another way you can look at Polygon wallets here. You see, I, I'm running out of Matic. You guys are running me up. All right, let's see it here. Let me see. Yeah. Do, 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 do. That's all I'm going to teach you. That's it. You guys are done. Yeah, we're good. We're good. Thank you.